Hello, hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Becky Metcalf, and on behalf of the Design Centre, a very, very warm welcome to our special WOW Talks. Um, these have been specially commissioned to coincide with, of course, the opening of WOW House, and I hope you've uh, been able to have a look through the amazing spaces. Gosh, it really is room after room of wonder. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. If I could ask you to just turn your phones off because we're recording the session, that would be wonderful. Well, this afternoon we're going to talk about distinctive interiors and we're absolutely thrilled that Bunny Turner and Brandon Schubert are here. You cannot imagine how busy their schedules are, so thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And who better to speak to them uh, than a magazine that is full of distinctive interiors, week after week, country life, of course. Um, and we're so thrilled that Giles Keim, uh, the executive and interiors editor, is going to chair the session this afternoon. Let's give them a really big round of, round of applause. Thank you, Becky, and welcome, everybody. Um, wow was certainly the, war, the word uh, that came to mind uh, when I uh, first stepped into the Wow House this morning. Um, I'm sure you've also all been. For me, it's very exciting because um, I'm, you'll be amazed to hear, I'm just about old enough to remember, the last proper show house in this country, which was, I don't know if any of you are also old enough to remember, but it was in, in 1988 or 1989 at Chelsea Old Town Hall. Um, and I got the same amazing feeling in my solar plexus this morning as I did then. And how extraordinary to be able to walk through spaces that uh, until very recently were literally just spaces. And how much those rooms say about interior design, the transformative um, uh, capacity of interior design to trans not just transform spaces, but tra transform, them, transform them in 20 different ways. And that speaks volumes about the subject that we're, we're discussing today, which is creating spaces that are distinctive. And you, know, you will have seen today how you move from one room to the next and you have a completely different response to what was effectively a brief for please design a to three meter by two meter or whatever it is happened to be. And how th before um, our very eyes, um, the, the various designers have created these uh, amazingly, uh, wonderfully disparate uh, uh, ra range of spaces. And also I think what's really interesting is um, not just the finish and the detail, but also how they are in their own way, timeless, they are, as smart today as I suspect they will be in 20 years' time. There's, there's no chasing trends. It's just really good interior design. And, and needless to say, it's very exciting to have with us this afternoon two people who created two very different rooms, but also two wonderful rooms. And I just want to ask, uh, start by asking you, um, what were the challenge, challenges, uh, Bunny, of... Um, not having a client, just having literally a blank piece of paper um, to transform. Um, I think not having a client is the challenge. People might think that's a really liberating thing, but actually it's the sort of restrictions, it's the lines that make the journey through a design easier, actually. Um, so understanding how a client wants to live in the space, use the space. So. Even when we didn't have one, I suppose we were imagining a library in the context of a house and how it might be used now. Um, so, you know, the freedom is great, but actually it's the tightness and constraints that help you build something authentic. And I think Emma and I really, really wanted to make sure that the room that we did come up with uh, could be populated, enjoyed, relaxed in, um, uh, and imagined in a real setting. Mm. And Brandon, for, for, for you, how was your, your client-free zone? How, did, what, how was that experience? Well, again, I, actually, I completely agree with Bunny that not having a real person it actually does make it harder because you, you can't take their um, instructions and act on them. But it, in a sense, I had an easier time because my room was for Morris & Co. And so 
those fabrics tell a very specific story and the wallpapers. And so teasing that out, you know, and, and making the essence of the collection, the centerpiece of the room gave me that kernel of a start for the design, which might be what you went through with the Julian um, uh, Chichester furniture, um, but it, it's probably a little bit easier when it's a fabric collection that has a very specific identity. Mm. That is interesting. I think the fact that we had a furniture supplier to work with over a fabric supplier um, meant that our interventions had to be very considered. We had sort of less space, I suppose, to upholster pieces and add character. But it was quite gratifying. On the first day, an American client came in and looked around the space and said, wow, who's, who's stand is this and um one of the julian chichester girls said it's julian chichester and she didn't recognize any of the furniture so the sort of recontextualizing of furniture through a designer's eyes um, and presenting it differently i think has had a really positive effect on the collection so bunny let's to talk us through your room which is on the screen in front of us now so our room our room is a library and libraries are wonderful things that actually sort of don't get thought of so much these days people are reading less and it might not be naturally the thing that you would put into a house but Emma and I love them we think they're full of character and they're incredibly versatile so we really encourage clients to sort of create libraries in their houses they make great dining rooms actually last night we were meant to have dinner in here um, and it would have been fun to have had a photograph of the table set up for you um, but sort of in the post-covid world as well thinking about how spaces have to, you know, multitask for you, really. Um, and a library is a, is, a, is a great space to um, achieve that, that variety. Um, so I personally love books. I, I absolutely love them. And I am a bit mistrustful when a client has a house with no books in it. What so, do you do if they don't? Well, um, we have been known to go and buy linear meterages of books, yeah. but it does upset me a bit that it doesn't feel very authentic and it definitely upsets the people selling the books. Yeah. Um, I remember the one of the first projects we did 15 years ago um, was for a single man who lived in a beautiful house on Carlisle Square and he had a library that was in a sort of dark oak finish, which actually we had sanded back by this amazing artisan and limed. And he was there for sort of six months doing it. But the shelves were full of these incredible books. And I thought this man was so well read. read. I just thought he was amazing. And then he told me on the night that we sort of handed over that actually someone had just bought them all for him. <laughs> and my sort of <laughs> delusions of his great intellect were shattered. Um, so, but, but I think books can be arranged in a way on shelves that are slightly more interesting than just linear spines. And what you want to do in a library space is create inviting, comfortable seating where someone reaches out, grabs a book, flicks through it. It just needs to be sort of cosy. And I think that was really what drove us. And the fabric um, is uh, by Pierre Frey. So it's a fabric that we had backed with paper. And it lends a nice aged pattern to the room. Julian Chichester furniture tends to be quite modern and streamlined, and we wanted to have that sort of feeling of an, a sort of old, musty space, and I think that the um, paper does that very well. Tell us about the table, because that's got quite a lot of comments. It, it has, yeah. So the coffee table, I think the play in design is always about mixing textures, colour and pattern. Um, and coffee tables are always quite tricky, because you can have a great big hunk of wood in the middle of the room. And this is, has a sort of metal patina, again, which is very tactile and sort of invites you to, to, to sort of sit around it. Um, What's it made out of? It's made out of metal. Right. Um, and then some more, another detail there. The, what, what, do you know what that, that PFRA fabric's based on? Is it on a document? It's based on um, Chinese ancestor paintings. So they, I actually have two original um, ancestor paintings at home. And traditionally, um, Asians were painted in groups of men or women. And they have these wonderful sort of colours. They're painted on raw canvases, mm. so they have a, a sort of texture to them. Um, but they have pops of these wonderful arsenics and blues against quite subdued tones as well. Mm. Um, so they're a wonderful starting point for a scheme, and they have that feeling of being found. So 
it doesn't all feel too put together, I think. And then, Brandon, so talk us, talk us through this wonderful space. So the design was entirely based around Morris & Co, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I tried to imagine how to reinterpret Morris & Co in a way that didn't feel completely predictable and that didn't feel like something that people had seen before because that's, we sort of all have uh, in our heads a vision of William Morris wallpaper and maybe it's different patterns and, and different colorways, but you kind of know what it is when you think about it. Um, and so I came across this fabric which I put on the walls, which was originally a wallpaper design, actually, um, from E.W. Godwin in, in the 1870s. And I had actually known it as a wallpaper design before I saw the fabric, and then I said, aha, that's it. So we started with the fabric walling, which again, paper back, same as bunny, and just applied directly to the wall like wallpaper, which is a great trick. I mean, it's more expensive than ordinary wallpaper, but it's a lot less expensive and labor intensive and delicate than stretched fabric walling can be. So it's a really good, and not every fabric, it doesn't work with every fabric, but if you've got a fabric with a lot of pattern, you, it, it tends to be very forgiving. Um, so starting with the fabric walls and then trying to bring in cool colors and different scales. So taking the scale of the pattern down onto the bed curtains and then down again onto the lining fabric. Um, and then finally to plain on the headboard. Um, and so that was, that was the sort of thought process. And I imagined that we were in the countryside. I imagined that we were in an older house that had had this decorative scheme for a very long time. And so I didn't want it to feel, I wanted it to feel rooted in history, which is the way that the fabric collection is, is obviously designed. And yet I wanted it to feel like something you hadn't seen before. So hopefully that was successful. It has a very nice structured feel, I think, your room. I like the taping on the, on the walls. It sort of encloses the pattern and sort of Thank keeps you. it tight. Thank you, yeah, uh, that's just a very simple 20 mil braid flat braid from George Spencer, um, which you just hot glue. I mean, honestly, that's all it is. You just hot glue it over the, over the edge of the fabric. And um, it's, it's a very neat trick to define around doorways, around fireplaces, and, and at the top and bottom, often used with stretched fabric walling because you need to hide the pins that hold the battens in. So that's what it's originally there for. And when you paperback fabric, you don't need to hide anything, but it's still quite a neat trick. And am I right in thinking that uh, uh, red fireplaces are a feature of your work. I'm using them all the time right now. I'm, I, they might become a feature of my work. Mm. Um, I think I just, we've seen so many white marble fireplaces that I am trying to find. In, in historic interior, I think it's very important to have the fireplace work with the house. So you don't want to go out and get necessarily something that's completely modern. You don't want something that feels like it's the wrong time period. And so we have so many Victorian era houses in England that if you find yourself in a Victorian era house, don't feel constrained by a white marble fireplace. The Victorians loved colorful marble. They loved things that were sort of over the top decorative. So, what do you think the the the, the secret of of avoiding a, a, or creating a, a space that has a period feel but doesn't feel like pastiche? I think the secret has to do. I couldn't tell you. There's not a there's not an exact formula, but I think it's about not feeling constrained uh, by the time period you're working in, while at the same time appreciating the time period you're working in. So, for instance, there's nothing in that photo that isn't, couldn't be of the time period. I mean, the artwork is a little bit more contemporary, but it's not drastically contemporary. Um, everything else could have been there, in a, in a sense, uh, in 1860 or whenever that room, 70, whenever that room might, might have been designed. But I think it's about presenting it in a way that doesn't feel... Um, like you're trying to recreate something historic. And mm. so looking at it with, a, with a more of a fresh mindset about mm. how you might hang pictures and how you might um, mix pattern and, and color. I don't know if that's a very good answer. Mm. But. So we've seen your two different spaces that are uh, both incredibly distinctive, incredibly timeless. Um, and that really is a, is a feature of your, the, 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 the work you do for clients as well. Um, Bunny, talk about talk to us about this space. Can created. I just say one thing as well, which we did chat about before yeah. about um, Brandon's room, which is a four poster bed is a very difficult thing to do well, and you did it very well. The Thank sort you. of proportions of pelmets and the height of the bed, you can get it so wrong, and if you get it even a centimeter wrong, it can feel jarring and not look right. 
So high fives for <laughs> thank you <laughs> for thank getting you. it. For it's getting also quite it nice out. when you don't see too much bed. You yeah, I, yeah, I agree. We were talking about how four poster beds in in one's mind's eye is a sort of wooden historic heavy thing, and actually, if you um, upholster and cover timber as the bed posts, they hide into the curtains like and become invisible. And actually, if you could, I don't know if you could flip back yeah, to the sure. image of the bed. No, you can't see the posts. But it, so they are, good. They so are well fabric wrapped. Um, they're fabric wrapped in the same fabric as the lining. And a note on proportion, I think when if you're ever doing a four poster bed, the temptation is to make the top of the bed too um, shallow. And actually the top of the bed can the balance uh, at the top can be quite or pelmet can be quite deep. Um, and so You have to spend time working it out. I have a four poster bed at home and the, the pelmet went back, I think, four times before I got it right. <laughs> they also don't require nearly so much, the same degree of investment, do they, as a massive statement? No, that's person, true. I mean, there's still, it's still a lot of fabric, but you can fabric. do clever things by using cheaper lining fabric on the inside yeah. and stuff like that, which yeah. you've done very well. I'm, I'm constantly pushing clients to things like that, and the number of people who say, absolutely not, I don't want to sleep in a four-poster bed, and I think, why not? It's such, it's such a nice place to sleep. I think it's... Um, I think my husband's reaction was, oh, my God, it's like a theatre. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so, wait, but if you live with one, is it hard to make the bed? Is it hard to... No, it's not, actually. I don't have anything at the end of the bed at the moment. But there is nothing nicer than lying and waking up with a sort of rose of ruched fabric above you. There's something so indulgent and wonderful about it. So, tell us about this marvellous space. So, this was a project in a glorious mansion block overlooking Albert, Albert, the Albert Hall and the music schools. Um, and when we first saw it, it was occupied by an accountancy firm and it had drop ceilings and you couldn't really appreciate the grandeur of the space and the ceiling heights. And one of our first tasks was to reimagine which rooms could be the kitchen. And of course, when this apartment was first made, kitchens would have been service quarters. You know, it's a wonderful building where the, the apartments open out of what would have been the historic carriage drive. Um, and we chose this room because the bay windows seemed like the most inviting space and the view to the Albert Hall from it um, was amazing to have a table. But I think what's interesting about this shot particularly um, is that it's a kind of lesson in texture, really. Um, so we think very carefully about practicalities when we're designing spaces. So we've got man-made materials on the island top, but the sort of roughness of the Julian Chichester oak finish on the table and the leather on the chairs and the brass lights, you know, your eye doesn't settle on any one thing. Um, so in a kitchen where you're limited with your materials, which was quite similar to the problems that we faced with designing our space, you have to think particularly carefully about hard finishes that you're working with. Mm. Um, and I, sorry, I also think that's particularly successful with the shapes you've chosen. So the round yeah. light fittings, the roundness of the table base, and the angularness of the of the kitchen units. Yeah, I mean, kitchens are hard. They can be boring sort of mm. task rooms, mm. um, and they should be that. I mean, they are functional spaces, but I think you can sort of really design it out. Very yeah, successfully. yeah. And and here, Brandon, you've used color to knock out the hard edges, really, haven't you? Uh, tried to. So that's um, this is a family house in Hampstead, and um, the 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 old kitchen was this sort of horrible thing that had been put in in the 90s with those giant brown cupboard knobs, and everything was falling apart. So we wanted a kitchen that felt honest to the Georgian house, but obviously not entirely honestly because it wouldn't be in this big central bay windowed room originally. Um, and so I designed the kitchen joiner to feel traditional and, and to feel Victorian. And um, we had it made by a joiner and um, sort of got some really lovely tiles from um, Sarah Balaneum and then put a sewn wallpaper on the walls. And that's varnished with, a, with an artist's varnish so that it's more durable. I mean, it's not completely durable, but it's splash proof and, and pretty good. So um, that's, that's a nice way to handle providing colour with a little bit of texture um, that can work in a wetter space like a kitchen. It just feels more decorated, doesn't it, when you put wallpaper? It's like putting wallpaper in bathrooms. Mm. It feels mm. sort of a bit jarring at first, but it does change your experience of quite a functional space. Definitely. 
Bunny, talk, talk us through this wonderful space. So this is a um, rather extraordinary muse that sits at the end of a cobbled walkway. And we actually dug a basement that was the footprint of the whole house and had to wheelbarrow the soil out. It was a real labor of love. But the space is extraordinary. Um, it has um, huge skylights on the roof that flood the space with natural light. Um, and again, it was all about playing on texture and materials and the sofa upholstery. We, we try not to make our schemes feel too schemed. So we often use kind of traditional fabrics like tickings on upholstery so they don't feel too contrived and they feel like something that you might reasonably have inherited over time. Um, and the the fireplace wall is in a in a kind of textured polished plaster finish and the the room that's jutting out above is actually a bathroom <laughs> which was quite challenging because the shower is in that area so we had to come up with some rather ingenious sheer fabric that was not too sheer that when you were in the shower you felt like you were actually on display to the sitting room down below <laughs> mm. um but the critical double height screen as well was quite a clever technique for getting light down the main stairwell and you'll see the stairs were designed so that they had open treads so as much light could get down into mm. the sunk light well and it, it's very very effective actually we come on later to an image of an orange sofa, which is much loved by people. And that room, which is a cinema room in the basement, sits off the stairwell and it gets a little bit of natural light. You know, basement's always so tricky mm. um, to, to make feel not like you're stuck underground. Joiner is a big thing for both of you. We'll see this as we go through. But It is. It's, um, it, it's always been a big part of, of what we do. And I think it grounds rooms, both in terms of functionality and um, sort of aesthetics. So we very much wanted to bring the space back to something slightly more traditional. And so a pedimented bookcase was quite a clever dominant feature in the room to, to do that. And also painting joinery dark is a great trick. I hate tellies, I hate them. I, I mean, I barely have one at home. Um, so when clients are obsessed about having huge TVs, it rather frightens me. But dark cabinetry is a really good way of mm. making them the less dominant feature in a room. Mm. And you don't notice it so much in this shot, do you? No, not at all. TVs are, it's always the push-pull with clients, which is it where, is. can you maybe just put that TV in your wardrobe and pull it out when I'm not here. Um, <laughs> Via Guarani was quite interesting. He, he, when he gave a talk, someone asked him about TVs, which was very pleasing, because it was a question I would have asked myself. Mm. And he said, well, you know, a TV is part of life. You've got to acknowledge it. So just have it out, mm. you know. He says, I have it on a stand in the corner of my room, which made me think sort of slightly 80s TV mm. style. Mm. But um, what I don't like is when they start becoming the real focal point above a fireplace or... Mm. That's know. the worst. And I yet know. sometimes in rooms, that's the only place you could reasonably put it. And you just think... Oh. I have a bit of a trick for that in persuading clients. I say, well, it's just technically not in the right place. It's too high. Too high. Yeah. <laughs> so do you know that that's <laughs> funny you say that? I have, a client, I have a client at the moment and I said that. I said, well, you can't have it above the fireplace. It'll be too Terribly high. bad for your neck. And he said, well, <laughs> let's put in a very low fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> so Damn I'm, now, it. I'm now in a position where I have a very low fireplace and very low TV. Yeah, that's not really your look, is, is it? A really <laughs> modern, not very nice fireplace with a TV above. Mm. Um, Brandon, tell us about uh, talking about televisions. There's another there TV. There we are. Perfect segue. So this is a this is um, actually interestingly this is the same house. You'll we'll come on to another image of the same house, but this is a terraced house in Clapham. And um, this was a rear extension that was there, inside side infill extension. You've seen a thousand of them if you've been around these kind of houses. And it used to have a kitchen in it, and it really didn't work very well at all. And so I have tried to bring a, a sort of um, acknowledge the architecture of the pop-out extension by putting teak paneling in so that that section feels different. It's clearly not the same as the section to the left, the original, um, what would have been the, sink, the, the roof extension room at the back of the house. Um, and I hope that sort of unifies, in a sense, the two by acknowledging that they're different. That was my goal. Um, and then, again, playing with color, I think, is, is something I, I love to do. So trying to bring in sort of brightly rainbow-colored carpet, brightly patterned and colorful artwork, and, and unifying it um, also with the joinery color and the footstool color, um, but then letting the sofa be less colorful. So not trying not to overdo it. What's the secret of getting the proportions of joinery right? 
Uh, well, I mean, from, from my training, which is fairly limited, but I used to work for a classical architect, Ben van Treith, and I would say that it's all innate in the classical proportions that have been passed down since the Greeks. Mm. Um, and that there's something that human beings tend to like about those classical proportions. There's a reason that golden ratio is something that, you know, you can give people photo quizzes and everybody will agree that that's a nice shape. Um, and so I think for some people that probably comes just by observation and you pick it up or you have it just sort of inherent within the way you look at the world. But it can all be learned. I mean, there are, you know, for, for instance, if you look at classical orders of architecture, there's large books that you can go to to look at the right proportions, for instance, to have skirting and cornice versus wall and dado panel. What is interesting, so we work on a lot of listed buildings and the heritage statement that accompanies applications for change, which is very, um, you know, the focus is about uh, preserving heritage, essentially. Um, you know, you have to reference back the proportions that were historically accurate for the house. And we've just done a house in Chester Square, an amazing house. And the drawing room has panelling to dado, which is so much lower than you would ever imagine it should be. Mm. Because I don't know if people were smaller, but chairs were lower. And mm. therefore, the panelling in the room to our eye feels low, but it's historically correct for the space, which I found really interesting, actually. Um, I think, you know, we do a lot, a lot of joinery um, and base it on sort of historic precedences. And we were discussing actually how we manage that within the studio. And there's a sort of language of, of joinery that we use in the, our work. Um, but you do have to adapt them to the scale of the room. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I think it depends also on the vernacular you're using. So this bookcase, for example, quite contemporary. There's no, you know, molding details. It's all square edges. Everything is, it, it is definitely a modern style of bookcase. Mm. And so what I could do there is take the base of the bookcase down to a level that put the television in the right place, mm. which you wouldn't necessarily have been able to do if that had been a big corniced, uh, traditionally designed sort of Georgian looking piece of furniture, because at that point, the proportions are all different because you have a skirting board on the bottom and you have a cornice on the top. Mm. And now all of a sudden that chair part needs to be higher. Yeah. And so then the TV would have been up higher. It wouldn't, wouldn't have worked as well, which actually will come on to a very similar bookcase in a, in a minute where mm. that was the case. Mm. But um, Bunny, this is the dining room of the property of the kitchen we looked at earlier. It is, it? yeah. Um, Dining rooms are something that people are quite keen to get rid of. You know, the whole narrative around how um, socially the way we occupy our homes is different and dining rooms are outdated mm. and we all eat in the kitchen now. Mm. But dining rooms are a wonderful thing, mm. just as libraries were, are. You know, they give you a flexible space, a quiet space to work. Mm. I, I think the idea, obviously, of a sort of board meeting long table that can seat sort of 12 to 18 people is something that's a bit hard to live with. But a room where you can have a round table um, with a lovely great big bunch of flowers and you know coffee table books there asking you to sit down and take a moment mm. um, is a really nice thing. Um, and that's what we did in this situation. There's actually off this room a double doorway where the photographer is standing that goes into a very, very smart formal reception room that has a sort of colonnaded balcony overlooking mm. the music school. Mm. I think it, convincing clients to have a dining room is, is like you said, a challenge now because yeah. everybody says, no, I don't, that's just not the way we live. But you're entirely right. If, if the space can be convertible from one thing into another thing, but can work as a dining room, it, everybody should want to have a meal in a nice room that is separate from your kitchen where you can take the dishes downstairs mm. and ha get them out of the way. We, um, we've we actually started encouraging people to have tables that they can eat at in their drawing rooms, which sounds really odd, but it's normally the nicest room in the house. It's the room that's least used. You sort of walk past it and go, ah, oh, lovely room, but they're actually sitting in so for Christmas and sort of high days that's and holidays. And so having a small table where you're, if you're an intimate group of four of you having dinner, you can sit down and enjoy it is a really good way of increasing footfall through the space. I really, it, it works really well. And I think also, you know, again, we've got to capitalize on our COVID learning and see that we can all live better in our homes if we just take a moment to, to sort of experience it differently. And I think, 
using spaces for different purposes to what they are conventionally intended for is a good way to do that. Mm. And so many dining tables are extendable, and so yeah. it can be a smaller table most of the time, and then you can convert the room when you when you need to. We actually we we really um, drill down into the practical requirements our clients have when we're at the early stages of the design development, and it's amazing how delusional we all are about how often we entertain. You know, people are like, we entertain the whole time, the whole time. So we've just got to have a huge table, and we're like, mm. well. Does that mean like once a week? Are you entertaining once a week? That makes me feel very tired. Um, and then you find out they're actually only entertaining three times a year and that, in fact, they don't need the great big table for that occasion. Um, mm. It's better that they have sort of a bit of ply that you put a tablecloth on that they can use for, for when, when they do. Mm. Um, very different response to a, a, a um, dining, dining room here, Brandon. So this uh, this is actually in the same house as the the room with the teak paneling, and this is at the front of the house. And I it, again, it's a Victorian terraced house, so it had the lovely cornice was original, but the design of the paneling is not original and is not something that you'd really actually expect to see in that mm. particular vintage of house. So I sort of imagined that someone had um, come through a few years after the house had been built and had a very specific style that they liked and that they installed that paneling. That was sort of my fiction that I had in my head. And then found a really beautiful um, Art Nouveau light fitting, antique light fitting and a 1920s table and then some 1960s chairs. Um, Arts and crafts is obviously a big inspiration for you, isn't it? Well, I think if, if you're thinking about design periods that inspire, right, you know, you there's there's obviously a great history in the UK of um, design and tradition and the 18th century, the various styles that are present then. Um, but it, I think when arts and crafts came around and also the aesthetic movement, which sort of coincides with arts and crafts, you find people really exploring um, design in a way that I find really extraordinary. Um, the, the proportions speak to me. Again, it's a slightly unusual proportion. You know, you think about how high that um, mantle is and how large the stone surround is. It's a it's a sort of a, it's not the classical proportions that I was just referring to when I was talking about the orders of architecture and all of that. It's something different. And you find people taking influence from Eastern um, culture and just coming up with these things that nobody had ever seen before, which is what I love about the eight, sort of period from the 1850s to the 18, well, really to 1910, probably. Mm -hmm. Do you take clients on that journey with you when you're imagining ah. or do you just? No, I don't. No. I would love to take a client on this journey, but I think they would probably... Um, go to sleep. In fact, this client, <laughs> this client did go to sleep and, and, and was uh, absolutely not interested. I showed her the drawings for the paneling and she just said, okay. Lovely. It looks lovely. It looks great. Yeah. And another very cosseting um, and, and a lovely mixture of things in this room here. So this, I think, again, it's about mixing time periods for me and I really, I really love to take a piece of Georgian furniture like that bookcase and put it next to a um, 1960s designed Danish sofa and with a chair that's from some other time period in front of it. And it's a little weird plastic sort of art deco lamp and just trying to bring elements from various time periods into the same room to make it feel layered and rich. And I think it, it there is a principle for me of the good design sitting next to other good design comfortably. And I think that is true throughout history and you know rarely in in historical rooms or, or rooms where somebody has accumulated things over generations are you going to find that everything's from the same time period it's just not usually that the way that people really live and so i think one of the challenges for an interior designer then is to come in and say all right well let me help you even though it's complete fiction because the client doesn't have those things and doesn't have a layered history of collection mm. to try to help create a sense of that mm. yeah mm curating a sort of authentic inheritance. And you said that earlier, which is to make a room feel real uh, yeah. and to make it feel like it isn't, it hasn't just been sort of magic wandered out of I also box. think in this day and age where we live in such a visually saturated environment, sort of mixing things from different periods that can't be copied or bought is really nice for the client. It, they know they have something unique, original, that can't be just bought. And clients do sometimes spark up with that, and they say, oh, amazing. I love the idea of collecting this. Let me collect alongside the collection that you've started, and then they'll go, they'll go wild. So I worked for a client who 
um, we put some Edward Bodden prints in her house, and then and the next thing you knew, she was buying Edward Bodden prints every chance she got, and she had a real sort of surge of interest in that. And and it's it's amazing to see clients come alive when you start to give them the the, the building blocks of how you might collect your own stuff. We're back to join you again here, Bonnie. So it's it's kind of hard working rooms, isn't it? It's it about is. making the most of the space that you have. Yeah, I think a room can't really um, sort of sing unless it delivers on function. And this is a playroom in a lovely detached house in St. John's Wood, which is visible off an open plan sort of living room. Shock horror. How do you deal with all the plastic rubbish that comes with mm. kids? So we made this. And then the important thing is that you do it in a way that's kid friendly. So they learn to clear up their stuff. So this is a built-in, comfortable bench. There's actually a TV tucked into a joinery piece off to the right of the shot. And then underneath it are drawers, which obviously for children are very easy to open and close and chuck all their toys in. Um, so it worked really well. And then having a sort of movable table with little stools in the middle um, makes the space open up if they suddenly want to do a show or and gymnastics. Again, the dark or windows or dark joinery. Color. Yeah, yeah. Super successful. Yeah. I Are think you? celebrating architectural features, if you have them, by painting them interesting colours is a really um, good thing to do. We're actually doing a conservatory on a house in the Cotswolds at the moment, and it's not the most beautiful structure, but we're going to paint it bright, bright emerald green, mm. and it's going to look fab. And then this is the comfiest sofa. I'm not big into cinemas. I think they feel a bit of an odd thing to have in a domestic setting. Um, but this is a big room with a huge TV behind you. And if you have furniture purely facing the TV, as you would in a cinema, it feels to me a little odd to live with that when you kind of walk through the space. And so we often do what we've done here, which is have chairs. These are swivel chairs in the foreground um, facing the sofa so that it feels more conversational. Sort of, And by virtue of that, it's more inviting to sit and spend time in. Um, but unconventional layouts like that, I think Colfax has done an excellent job in their yeah. room here. You know, it's a it's a lesson in you know thinking outside the box of in, in layout terms. Anyway, um, also an important ingredient there is what you have on the walls, and that's a big challenge for interior designers, isn't it? It is. Yeah, I mean, you've got any advice? So we always come to the art after we've done a sort of detailed design package for the house and we establish what the principal uh, sort of walls are you know we design with very strong vistas in our mind through houses and so you know that a house will be incomplete without something hanging in those specific locations so we turn our clients mind to it quite early on in the journey once they've committed to furniture layouts and they understand how the room is going to work for them but we are very big believers in mixing high and low so you know, I remember there was a picture actually at home that I couldn't afford. It was a print by Mel Ramos that my husband particularly loved. So I bought a postcard of it and I framed it and then um, sort of scattered more serious things around it. And I think I'm a real hoarder when it comes to our, my walls at home, um, our floor to ceiling pictures in a slightly claustrophobic way, I think, for most people. Um, but I love the memory of buying things and collecting them. And funnily enough, a gallery wall puts much less pressure on the pieces that you hang. Mm. So clients feel much more confident about nipping out and buying some things that they love, but don't put undue sort of pressure on the, on the choice. Do you work with consultants? We do work with consultants. We have a lovely consultant called Rebecca Gordon, who works very closely with our clients to find the sort of main pieces and she builds a relationship with them that lasts, you know, for a long, long time. Mm. So that if in five years' time she finds something that she thinks they would like, she'll send it to them, which is rather an amazing relationship. Mm. And again, I think the key is not to overfill um, when you complete the project because you want to give them room to add and grow and, you know, mm. hang their own things that they find. Mm. Although the number of times you go back and find out that nothing has been hung in those places. Yes, mm. yes, that's <laughs> true. Gosh, that's looking very um, yellowy green on the screen, isn't it? <laughs> it's actually a much calmer, nicer shade of greeny yellow in real life. So you've really sort of celebrated that, that bit of joinery, haven't you? Yeah, so this is a basement uh, TV room, and it was designed as a TV room. Um, and again, you know, TVs are part of life, so they might as well be inside a nice container. 
And the client came to me and said, I, she had an image from Instagram of a blue room. And so she said, I want it to be dark blue. So I tried to, but the image was completely modern. You know, it was honestly, there were no, you know, it was a very contemporary room. So I tried to take the essence of it and bring it into a more traditional setting. Um, and I think, you know, what, what we don't want to be afraid of as designers, but also with any client or any person decorating their own house shouldn't be afraid of is to play around with color and to try things that, that are perhaps not intuitive. And so a, a, on this screen, that doesn't look like the fantastic color combination that I think it is in real life. But, you know, picking a sort of apple green to go next to dark blue uh, was not an intuitive choice. And um, actually was when I came to fairly late in the process. I wasn't sure what color the bookcase would be. And, um, and so I think take, you know, take risks and, and push the color envelope. And then finally, this wonderful space that you've completely sort of lifted with this glorious color. Thank you. So this is um, a Georgian house and just had a lovely, beautiful staircase that we, uh, it's actually going to get a runner eventually, but in, when I took this photo, it didn't have the runner uh, down. And it's a very light touch, but just an example of with good architecture and good bones to a house, you can get away with a light touch. And so painting the walls in this deep orange color, which is a Dulux trade paint, and allowing the woodwork to be a very crisp white. So, um, you know, instead of, oftentimes I try to use, a, if I'm going to use white, I'm gonna use a white that's fairly dingy to try to, to try to not highlight sort of the brightness so much. But in this case, to allow the contrast to really be the story. Um, and I think let the architecture be what it is. Mm -hmm. And you can just see through to a bright blue entrance hall beyond. And actually the color story goes on in this house. Um, the client really loved color and so, um, it, it does continue room after room of sort of uh, bold color combinations, which hopefully are successful in the entirety. Bold color combinations, um, mixing different styles, um, allowing architecture to be itself. There have been um, all sorts of really um, interesting lessons to take away from today in terms of creating distinctive interiors. Um, and I have to say the last 50 minutes or so have gone Incredibly quickly, but I am conscious that there might be people in the audience who'd like to ask you some questions. Um, so please don't be shy. Um, Becky's here with a microphone, if there's anybody who'd like to ask a question. Did everyone hear what I said? Um, you, you talked about your love of arts and crafts. In that particular house where, that you, where, for which you designed the, um, that rather beautiful panelling, was that because the house was of that era or was it because you felt that it would respond strongly to the, the modern um, chairs you chose and, and, and table? Well, I started with the, I started with the panelling and, and thought about the architecture of the room first. So it wasn't exactly of the period that, you know, the outside of the architecture of the building is not arts and crafts, but it could have been renovated by someone a few years after it was built who had a different view of what they wanted. So it sort of made sense in my head, historically, the timeline. But I started with the paneling and thought, how do I add architectural interest to what is otherwise a fairly humble Victorian terraced house, sitting room, front sitting room. And so the paneling was my idea of how to do that and to, to make the fireplace into something dramatic. And then filling it with things that, that, that I liked, not necessarily that were arts and crafts themselves, because actually nothing in the photo other than the paneling had any overt arts and crafts connection. So that was, um, that was my goal. But I, I did a little sketch for the client and tried to show what I was gonna do. And um, actually the end result came out very similarly to the sketch. So, but she did make me get that light fitting on approval. She didn't trust me on that one. <laughs> uh, just on the mention of clients, actually, uh, obviously, if one's trying to create something that is unique to them and which is distinctive, there is a journey, as you say, that you need to go on with them. What, um, Bunny, what's your advice to, to any professional interior designers in the audience about managing the expectations of clients and also perhaps encouraging them to accept ideas that they might not have done previously? I think if you 
continually come back to function and deliver on that, then you can persuade most people to do most things. Interesting. So a room is only as successful as it, its delivery on purpose sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you can justify brave choices if you know it's going to work yes. for them. Yeah. That's and the really brave choices are worth worth doing. There, we were saying before, there's always a, a there's one headache in a job always, and it's usually the thing that you're being bravest with, and it's worth worth persevering because it usually pays off, doesn't it? Yeah, we were talking about that earlier about uh, just taking that risk to go a little bit outside your comfort zone and try designing something, some element that is um, you're worried about not working because you're not sure if it's going to come together or not. Um, I but have if, that at the moment with a light fitting and I'm absolutely dreading it going in. <laughs> I really hope it works. <laughs> and, and conversely, what do you do if a client comes to you and they've just got endless screen grabs from Instagram or Pinterest and they've got, just got endless bloody ideas? <laughs> well, when, well, well, when we started, um, people bought um, tear sheets from magazines and they used to collect them and there was this sort of treasured pile of lovely um, torn bits of paper that oozed their sort of creative ideas. And that was really fun. We're not very keen on that. I want that from their phone thing. And we slightly say that if that's what you want to do, then we're probably not the right people for you. The journey that we'll go on is to create a home that's unique to you, right for you. We'll take references from, um, you know, visual imagery, but we always try and actually go back to historic tomes in our library mm. to draw and extract new ideas from from those rather than the, the sort of images that have most currency at the moment. And I think our goal with any interior is to make sure that, it, you know, sustainability is a very difficult narrative for our industry because actually fundamentally we're an acquisition sort of based business mm. but what we can do is build interiors that last yeah that stand the test of time i did my house in london 13 years ago and i haven't changed one thing in it mm. and that's quite an amazing feeling for mm. you know most people assume that an interior designer would go around changing things the whole time but i think if you get it right first time and you're really authentic about about how you want to use it and live in it then, you know, it'll deliver for you. Mm. They have to be workhorses, our houses, not show ponies. That's what we say. Rousing stuff. <laughs> um, any other? Um, I think we're, we're, um, we've come to the end of our lost time, but I'm really grateful to both of you um, for coming along and sharing your ideas. Um, and also, needless to say, to Claire and Becky and their team here at the harbour for pulling off this really amazing feat downstairs. Um, it was clearly your lockdown project, which you've managed to bring brilliantly to life. Um, huge challenge and many, many congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. A, a few thanks from us. Goodness me, uh, I sort of feel we've been in a masterclass this afternoon. So many decorating secrets. Oh, blimey, you create interiors of, of style and individuality, you two. Honestly, it's amazing. And we adore your wow rooms. Uh, Brandon, putting Morris at the centerpiece of your, of your room, quite incredible. That layer, that pattern on pattern, that amazing cocooning bed with willow bough and oak around it, quite lovely. And Bunny, your library. Goodness me, it feels relaxed in there. You just want to read a book. Uh, kick off your shoes, have a cocktail maybe from that cocktail cabinet. Um, it's, it's so beautifully stylish and beautifully curated. But you showed us so many other projects and you let us into your world and how you work and what you do. Proportions, mixing of styles, function I know is a big thing for you, Bunny, and that sense of how a scheme should look as if it's evolved over time. Thank you for our marvellous masterclass. What a great way to start our WOW Talks. I think we should give them another enormous round of applause.